Okay, big applause for Daniel McKenzie. Thank you. Right, hello, lovely people. Um, disclaimers first. First disclaimer, this is a new talk, so it relies heavily on a script. I hope you uh, excuse, excuse us. Um, second thing, this is supposed to be a practical lecture, which doesn't mean that we are doing an actual conjuring here, but it should enable you to go out and try it yourself. But I'm not starting at zero here. I'm, if, you're, if you're just a beginner, which is absolutely fine, great, do your groundwork, learn your meditations, learn your techniques, and then go on into conjuring if you feel like it. So there are a couple of techniques that I might just mention in passing. You need to do your homework yourself and then actually get it first. And the third one, although I'm going to, well, sort of, this Rosicrucianism and uh, various other approaches, that doesn't mean that I believe they are wrong and I am right. If you are a conjurer in the Goetic tradition or the Grammaric tradition, and you're good at it and it works for you, please keep on doing it. Just because I don't feel comfortable with it doesn't mean you have to. Right, thank you. And as a good druid, I like you, before I really start this whole thing, um, I invite you to take three breaths together. One with the earth beneath our feet. And one with the sky above our head. and one with the abundance of life all around us. And so it begins. Right, a little bit of a personal story first. In 1999, I was a part of the um, Servants of Light School of Occult Science by Dolores Ashcroft Novicki. And I was invited by a group of members of the SOL to participate in a series of conjurations. They, or actually we, I was part of it, um, we wanted to change a neighborhood in Manchester that had a drug and violence problem, and we wanted to send in elemental spirits to sort that mess out. And it was all very hermetic and Kabbalistic, and we had all the right angels uh, behind us, and we told the spirits exactly what to do and what consequences might have when they didn't. And we were very pleased with ourselves when the conjuring was successful and everything. And it was successful. I'm getting to that later. But still, even at that time, it left a stale taste in my mouth because I thought, I don't treat people like this. Why should I buzz around spirits as if they were my inferiors? This isn't right. Well, and many things went right. So um, five years later, I got the boot by Auntie Dolores and <laughs> joined the Order of Bards, Ovids and Druids instead, which I'm still a member of. And many people in the previous years referred to my style of magic as Druidcraft, so it was natural to sort that out and, oh, yeah, they're doing exactly what I want. And, um, yeah, Druidry is still a part of this so-called Western mystery tradition, but it has some very unique philosophies and approaches to many spiritual things that are quite distinct from more Kabbalistic-based schools like Rosicrucianism. And Druidry is sensual, Druidry is earthy and practical, and most importantly, it is very environmental and ecology conscious. It teaches us that we have to re-evaluate our standing within our ecology, the seen and the unseen. And it teaches us to deepen our relationships to the world around us. Emma Russell, or the 
uh, former head of the British Druid Order, um, even made a point in one of her books calling Druidry a spirituality of relationships. And relationships to humans and non-humans alike inform and shape a lot of Druid philosophy and ethics. So learning and relearning this special approach kept me busy for a couple of years and, well, apart from the actual Druid rituals and everything that came with it, I didn't do much of anything else from the ritual side of magic. Well, and then in 2015, I was fortunate to meet the late Jake Stratton Kent in Glastonbury. May he rest in power. And we got chatting, and I uh, exp uh, expressed my interest in, in conjuration, and I also expressed my utter disgust when it came to recreating monotheistic-based uh, liturgy and rituals and, and everything that came with it. And Jake pointed out to me there and then that, well, grimoires are just as much a product of their time and their culture as we are. They were made up by people at a certain time and at a certain place. So there is no law against it that I tried for myself, that I, well, find my own approach, find my own path, something that resonates with me, with my ethics, with, yeah, in a way, the, the, the whole pattern from which I work from. And... Yeah, that struck a chord. And I actually started experimenting with it. And that I've been doing for the last eight years, and especially during the pandemic years, when all of us had loads of time at their hands, um, that gave me ample time to actually, yeah, go into conjuring and, and do a lot of it. And uh, I had two Druid friends in the UK who um, came along and wanted to join the experiment. So we were three who could actually um, compare notes, which was absolutely great. We found out what worked for all of us, what worked for just one of us, and so on and so forth. So this led to that particular conjuration liturgy you have now in your hands, hopefully all of you. Well, to appreciate what makes the Druid approach in conjuring special, but it was actually for me, sort of uncomfortable uh, coincidence, I had written this whole talk. I had everything, and, and, and then I got in the mail, Frater Ackers, Gothic Atavism, and I read it, and I just thought, oh, you cheeky bastard. <laughs> he basically wrote the book I wanted to write. <laughs> but it's great, so... Um, but in a way, that taught me that the, this approach isn't unique. I mean, if you know the works of Frater Acker, he comes from a heavily uh, Rosa Christian background. And even he questions all this paradigm and said, right, no, there is something off here. We need to find another way. And he found a way that is beautiful. So if you're interested in going into this work, have a look at this. It costs a bit, but... Goetic atavisms. Um, on the back of uh, the handout, there is a list of books that went into this, uh, or will get a mention. So, well, coming back to um, what makes this, in a way, not that unique, but from our perspective, and. Um, to understand that, we need to understand first a little bit more about Druidry. Um, first and foremost, Druids are spiritual environmentalists. We, found our, we find our spiritual connection within the natural world. We seek places of natural beauty for our rituals and meditations. We study the natural world, not just to understand the world more, but in order to understand ourselves better and to find our places within that world, that wider world. And the study of ecology is not simply limited to the outer ecology of, of plants and animals. It extends to 
an ecology of spirit, which in the end arrives at a much more holistic cosmology. And that gets interesting since Druidry diverts from the usual Western spiritual cosmologies, whereas a Kabbalist or a Western ritual magician has a clear hierarchy of angels and demons and other spirits that all fall very neatly into the nice ten boxes of the Tree of Life, and they are easily um, divided into good and evil and, yeah, well, we look at spirits and we see the crawling chaos. And I know it's a Lovecraftian, very cheesy analogy. Well, apologies for that, but still, no, I mean this literally. If you go to the woods and just lift up any stone, you will find a multitude of insects and beings under that storm that all just crawl away, so hence crawling chaos. But the interesting thing is you find a little ecosystem there, and none of those beings within that ecosystem is more or less important than the other. If you take maybe a pill buck away, the whole system collapses. So everything within that ecosystem is equally valid, equally important. And since Druidry is deeply rooted in, well, what we're still calling problematically animistic, wherever we look, we find, well, similar ecosystems of spirits. And those spirits simply refuse to be put in neat little boxes and stay there. Again, crawling chaos. So making contact in nature, um, teaches us a lot about making contact with spirits. First of all, I mean, imagine you want to see a stag, you want to encounter a stag, a deer. What do you do? Of course, you go into the woods. If you just go into the woods and stomp around, you won't see a deer. So in order to see a deer, you have to become very quiet, very peaceful. Um, you have to be careful not to set off all these other animals, that alarm system of the forest, all those birds that either go silent or give a sound to warn other animals. And yeah, you have to move very carefully. You have to move not like a predator. So this is the first step. And then when you've found your inner calmness, your inner peace, and you have the world around you at peace, with luck, you will see a deer. Okay, this is just the first stage. You've seen a deer, you haven't really encountered it yet. Maybe you have some, some treats in your pocket, a carrot, an apple, something. If you're really good at it, and if you're really calm, the deer might actually come and take the apple. And if you come back ever so often and have a treat with you, the deer will come again. And sooner or later, the deer knows you and, and seeks you out and, oh, you made a friend. Look. And, yeah, some people even get as good at it as um, they're starting to, in, yeah, make animal noises, and the animal looks for, oh, who's sending out a mating call at this time of year? Uh, <laughs> well, and I could stop here and say, right, this is the basic of druid conjuring, in a nutshell. Of course it isn't, there's a bit, little bit more to it, but if you imagine yourself, when you're dealing with spirits, you're, you are a nature documentarist. You are actually on a very good way. So it's an, it's an attitude thing. I've already mentioned, Druidry is a spirituality of relationships. Druids are good at creating relationships and networks and connections. We, well, at least we strive to be very approachable. Don't talk to me before I had my tea. Um, 
If you want to read a very, very good example how this is done with trees, have a look at Penny Billington's Nine Ways to Charm a Dryad. And please don't be put off by the rather whimsical um, design of the book. <sighs> the graphic designer just run with it and yeah. It is a very, very good book by a very, very sweet lady. Um, Penny Billington is an absolute treasure. So, and, and yeah, this is how you approach a tree spirit by, well, basically being around and being nice to it. Some say in order to foster deep and meaningful relationships uh, or connections of any kind, with any kind of beings, humans, animal or spirit, you need to have a common base. And this is true to a certain degree, but you also need to see and understand the otherness of that being. The, and not just understand the otherness, you have to be non-judgmental about it. Everyone who drives a car or who works in retail know how difficult this is with our fellow human beings. Now imagine you're dealing with a consciousness that is completely alien. Yeah, and here the next Druid virtue comes in. Another thing that we need to understand about Druidry is that we are almost obsessively non-binary. Whereas other traditions look for and work with polarities, which is absolutely fine, but um, by the way, if you really want to trigger an occult rant within me, ask me about the Kubalion. <laughs> yeah. Druids like things that come in threes, like threesomes. No, seriously. <laughs> the recurring number in Druidry is three. It starts with the three grades of Bard, Ovid and Druid with the three worlds above, below, and all around, with wisdom teachings that come in three stanzas called the triads, and so on and so forth. And the Druids have a tendency to look for the neither nor, the third way between two given choices. It's something that yeah, almost becomes second nature over the course of the study of many years. And it's an interesting thing because thinking in terms of binary oppositions makes it difficult to notice the existence of options other than the true proposed. Whereas a tertiary view automatically opens not just three, but a multitude of options. And that is a very, very helpful mindset for many situations. It opens up many avenues and connections. It's like a fractal, where one triangle connects to the other and other, and in the end, you end up with a bigger and, and much more complex shape. And this mindset has implications towards our cosmology too. Whereas the grammaric tradition has a clear binary worldview of angels and demons and spirits that move with or against the one true liar, God. Um, Druids are actually, and all animists, much more nuanced here. Just because something is not very well disposed towards humans or even lethal when encountered doesn't make it evil. If I enter a tiger's enclosure to have a closer look at it, and the tiger takes me off the senses, that doesn't make the tiger evil. It makes me dinner, but it doesn't make me good either. So, hmm? And as spiritual environmentalists, sometimes it may be actually necessary to introduce a predator to an ecosystem in order to balance it. Just look at what the wolves in Yellowstone did. It's amazing. So, yes, sometimes you don't do nice, you do necessary. And lastly, thirdly, see, I'm doing it again. I'm explaining something in terms of threes. Um, we need to look at another concept, and that is honor. 
And because we're using a bit of an antiquated word here that has suffered a lot of abuse in the last years, um, let me assure you, our Druidic definition of honor has nothing to do with um, right-wing twats going on with blood and honor or anyone who just committed an honor killing. No, sorry, no. The Druid definition of honor is more along the lines of integrity and truth. Druids like to walk, and literally walk, we are the spirituality of the walking stick. Um, we like to walk our talk. We like to embody what we believe. We like to embody myth. Um, in Obot, as in many other Druid uh, orders, you're probably going to reenact a special story, the story of Taliesin, the first bard of Britain. And by reenact, I don't mean in just a single initiation ritual. You engage with this material for at least a year. You deconstruct it, you identify with it, you work with it. So at the end of the year, you can clearly stay out there with the rising sun on your forehead and proclaim, see my radiant brow. You not just learn the story of Taliesin, you become Taliesin, you become the radiant brow, you become the cauldron born. And by becoming this story, by integrating this story into your story, you learn how to integrate other stories into your story. And in this way, Druids enrich their own narrative with the narratives of myth, and we try to learn their lessons. We are making myth true. And an important cry of that just actually unites the more cultural Druids of the uh, Welsh I Stethford and um, the spiritual Druids is Igwir in Erwin Vith the truth against the world. Now, within this true myth, we find not only pointers about how to change ourselves and how to make magic, we find ethical structures that uphold that magic. We find a cultural framework. And those ethical structures, or one of those ethical structures, is the law of hospitality especially in Scotland and Ireland, I mean, all around the world, but from our European Celtic perspective, especially in Scotland and Ireland, the hospitality laws are still widely practiced and alive. But especially when you look at Celtic myth and in fairy tales, you suddenly realize that hospitality is almost a law of nature. It is a force. And this hospitality not only extends to people or to humans, it extends to spirits too. And all this filters into what Druidry is today, and that is part of our living narrative, among other aspects. It is part of the integrity, the honor, and that becomes the bedrock of Druid power and authority. Now, Let's have a look at <clears throat> let's have a look at the handout, and I'm already running low on time. Hear me, O oh spirit, who is name, title, function, power, etc. I greet and honor you. We are basically following Inigo Montoya's rule of networking here. <laughs> Anyone not familiar with Inigo Montoya? Inigo. Yeah, there are some here in the front, just pass them around. Um, Inigo Montoya is a character from The Princess Bride. He is the one who goes around, Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die. So, which breaks down as a polite greeting, hello, a personal introduction, my name is Inigo Montoya, a meaningful connection, you killed my father and manage expectations. <laughs> Prepare to die. <laughs>
The thing is that an invocation or litany is as much for the receiver, the spirit, as well as for the sender, the magician, the druid who says it. It's not just pretty text, it's magical utterance. And it helps many people to get a tad more formal to get in the right mood and headspace. So our hello is a little bit more elaborate. Please also note that we just don't say the spirit's name. We also describe the spirit by its function, its dwelling place and such. And that is also important because, well, sometimes we even don't have a spirit's name. We just know, yeah, there is something here, don't have a name for it. Or you just have a function of a spirit, which, by the way, is very common. If you look at Kabbalah, um, any Kabbalists say, right, yeah, Raphael, God heals. Mikael, God supports. So you can just go, hear me, O spirit, who dwells in this place. Hear me, O spirit of the place. Then it really pays off to do your research. This conjuration was successfully tested on elemental spirits from Bardon's book. And on elementals, we just ourselves contacted. And on Olympic spirits and on spirits from the Ars Goetia. And recently on the Bohemian spirits. If you read any book by Jake Stratton Kent or David Rankin or Stephen Skinner, you quickly realize that there's a lot of more to the spirit's character than those books convey. Um, Somersault offers demons, and they're actually gods and goddesses. As Jake Stratton Kent pointed out, sometimes a complete different spirit could also be connected to a sigil that has been used for hundreds of years. So sometimes you get the equivalent of new phone, who's this? <laughs> so that is why your introduction becomes a little bit more than elaborate than Inigo's one. You go on, I am, stating your birth name, known as, if you have any, spiritual or other names. And now we're getting into a little bit of uh, well, describing your work. You're saying, I am Bard, I'm born of Caridron's cauldron, filled with Arwen, at one with earth, water, air, and fire. This refers to the Bardic course and the Bardic journey you took there, the whole thing with the myth. I am Ovate, I'm rooted in the land like a tree, supported by my ancestors of land, blood, and spirit, speaker for the dead and the voiceless. I am Druid, servant of my gods and my tribe who stands between light and dark, between star and stone, and still I am neither. This is the first major difference to a Solomonic evocation, which at this point would go on like, by the power of the angels behind me and the name of the god Tetragrammaton above me, and this approach actually um, termed the wonderful Ferdiad McGowan of London's Temesis Grove as this is conjurations, conjuration for Karens. <laughs> like in, you have to obey me because I know your manager. <laughs> the only power a druid relies on is their own. It's gained through work, the work that they put in. It's not power over, it's power with. We as druids simply state, here, look, I'm doing the work, I'm trying to be a nice and useful person, want to chat? But this is, in all sincerity, your integrity passport. Don't just copy these paragraphs here. If you're, well, I'm not talking to druids, but still, if you are, and if you're only an ovate and haven't progressed to druid yet, don't claim the truth of the Druid. If you're currently at war with your ancestors, don't claim to be supported by them. If you've just moved here and still need to find your roots, well, don't mention them. If you're a completely different kind of practitioner, come up with something from your own practice. Maybe mention your work with herbs. And if you're a witch or not a Druid at all, find meaningful ways to introduce yourself that reflects your work and isn't a boast. Don't claim initiations 
that you don't have. Don't sell off your nan as a witch just because she put out a saucer of milk every night and told you it's for the fairies. It was for the bloody cat. <laughs> your integrity is an actual spiritual currency. And if you fake your passport, let's just say the border control isn't that forgiving. So now, we said who we are. We move over to meaningful connection. I have made myself clean and pleasant for you. This is a tricky bit, and many beginners like to overlook this. It's a period of fasting and purification. I could go for an hour about fasting and purification in ritual magic, and I only have an hour for this, so I won't. But um, let's just say it's not just a Christian thing. Look at the PGM and you find many, many rites that ask the practitioner to refrain from sexual contact for a while, that they bathe and that they put on fresh clothes. And sometimes this is exactly what you need to do. And sometimes it just depends on the spirit. Some are happy if you've showered and don't care if you've taken part of a group version of the great rite the night before. Um, and others demand that you sleep with your hands above the blanket for a week. And the same goes for fasting. I found that elemental spirits don't care what you have eaten or if you have eaten. And on the other hand, some land spirits are get very, very testy if you haven't been vegan for at least a week. And they take offense if you stood in front of a butcher's shop for too long that day. Other systems even ask for a confession. And again, this isn't reserved just for Catholics. It's an unburdening of any guilt that you might harbor. And, and it means you, you're taking responsibility. And you're not just taking responsibility for your own sins. You're taking, in this instance, responsibility for the sins of all humankind. Because most of the time when you do a conjuration, the, the spirits don't see you the individual, they see you, the human, who in that instance stands for all of them. So, yes, take responsibilities for the shortcomings of the whole species Homo sapiens. It really pays into your integrity passport. If you're unsure how to proceed here, rule of thumb is attend to conjuring like you would a romantic first date or a job interview. And yes, I'm aware of people with a body order kink, been there, done that, sniffed the t-shirt. But just imagine that you don't know what the other is into, so don't take any risks. Have a bath in salt water, shower in salt water, recite your favorite cl cleansing chant, put on clean robe or clean clothes. And then we're making our meaningful connection even more meaningful, and this is important. I have looked upon and searched my whole being and found myself related and in sympathy to you. Hear me, O oh Spirit. I'm calling you by the power of, well, whatever relates to you. The idea of, or that idea, is most prominent in the work of the Czech magician Franz Bardon and his tradition of uh, magical evocation. And Bardon teaches a system where you spend a lot of time accumulating a special power, say the power of the element of water, and then releasing it into your temple because, well, you have to be in the same environment that the spirit you're conjuring. And you can say about Bardon's literary style and his didactics what you want, but in this particular case, you're spot on. Um, you can only get into contact with spirits with whom you're already related. Luckily, you are related. Almost everything leaves a trace within you. The elements, the planets, angels, demons, everything. And it is your job to find that little thing, that inner Venus or that inner fire, that inner animal or tree, and then to use it to appeal to the larger spirit without. 
And a lot of magical training is concerned just with this. This is one of the reasons why Ovates spent nearly a year becoming animals and plants and places in meditation. So, yeah, you're using this here. And then we, well, now we're going to, to Trungas from Inigo's formula a little bit, and we lay out a bait. Not just that. I have already mentioned that this is a narrative. It is something that tells the truth. You describe something to yourself and to the spirit because that is what makes the whole thing visible on the inner levels. So you describe what you do or what you have done and give it an inner layer. You say, I open the gate for you. Come spirit and be, be invited in. And depending on your technique, you open some kind of gate between the seen and the unseen. You should know how this works. But again, you're being polite here. You're inviting in, you're not summoning in. If you've ever been, as a kid, summoned to the headmaster's office, you knew you were in trouble. If you were invited, well, that's a completely different thing. I've made a place so we can meet. Come, spirit, and let us enjoy good hospitality. And here it gets interesting, because in the second sentence, that invokes the concept of hospitality for the very first time. The whole promise of, I won't or even I can't harm you, and therefore you can't and won't harm me. We could argue this is a little bit of a binding, but a very benevolent one. And the first bit refers to the whole circle and triangle business. And authors like Bardon insist that you always need a circle of protection and a triangle of manifestation to summon any kind of spirit. Well, cousin Frank, Franz didn't have much of a resource base, I gather. Um, there are plenty of texts about, like the Arbatel, that mention neither a circle nor a triangle. And then there are other texts that refer to the circle for the magus to stand in. Others just say, right, we use the circle to have the spirit to appear in. It's not universal. You have to really find out what works in that situation with that spirit and for you. The most important part, though, is that you have made a place. And if it isn't your place, you can even say, right, I've come to this place so we can meet. But again, very much depends on the spirit you're dealing with. Some insist of the whole circle and triangle business. They are used to it. Um, others couldn't care less. And yes, sometimes, I mean, I like to refer to the, the whole circle business as a shark cage. Nature documentaries. If you're encountering a deer, well, you won't need much of a cage around you. If you want to encounter a shark, well, they need to bite the cage. They need to bite anything to find out what it is. That's just their nature. That doesn't make them malevolent. So, yeah, sometimes you need the shark cage. Sometimes you need the circle to stand in and say, right, yeah, this is it. The next bit goes on, I have prepared a place for you, a seat of hospitality for a guest. Come, spirit, and be welcome. And again, not necessarily the triangle, but at least have a focal point for the spirit to appear in or appear from. It can be a simple altar with just a sigil on it. It can be a black mirror. It can be a piece of wood from a special tree whose spirit you want to contact. It can be just dirt from a special place where you want to contact the genius loci and you're 300 miles away. It can be a skull. And any, by the way, any skull will do. Even spirits of dead humans will use a dog skull if need be. There aren't that tricky there. So, have something there. You know what you need. Research your spirit. I burn sweet incense and pour rich libations for your pleasure. Come, spirit, and enjoy your offering. We invited a guest, 
And the law of hospitality dictates that we spoil our guests a little bit. So dish out your best incense and good meat and make your spirit a feast. It's actually a good idea always to have a good flask of whiskey with you. <laughs> no, seriously, you can always pour a libation in a pinch. And I haven't yet encountered the spirit who refuses it. I mean, it's whiskey. It's called an alcoholic spirit for a reason. <laughs> and some spirits have cultural offerings and offerings that have signatures that are related to them. Some diamonds of the PGM demand figs and dates and myrrh, and some are very fond of eggs. And yeah, believe it or not, I witnessed the successful evocation of Zeus with a ham sandwich. It was one of those very first times I thought, oh, fuck, this works. I want to learn this. <laughs> so we're going on. Hear me, O spirit. Come through the gate. Come to this place. Come take your seat. Come enjoy your offering. Come and let us converse as friends. This bit actually started out as just a poetic flourish. And then we found out, no, this is good. It focuses the whole thing again. And it also relies on being non-threatening. Let us converse as friends means I'm not binding you. I may be in my shark cage, but this is only because you need to bite things and I'm a little bit fragile. I understand. Bite the cage. Hear me, O spirit. I call you by the power of Arwen, creative force of the universe, sacred sound of the Druids, utterance of the divine. So far, we haven't had any Vox Magicae or barbarous words. Now, the thing with Vox Magicae is there are signs in themselves. Some are bastardized names and epithets of local gods and goddesses. Some are just combinations of sound, glossolalia. I have come to the same conclusion as Jonathan Mac Josephine McCarthy and others. I believe that Vox Magicae are transponder waves or, or keys that are linked to a specific spirit and they make the contact easier. So if you have a spirit that has Vox Magicae assigned to them, use them here. If you don't, use Arwen. Arwen is it's basically the, um, the druid druidic concept of the Jedi Force. It's the inspirational spirit that flows through the universe. And the three dashes at the bottom of the page mean you're intoning the Arwen three times. So you go, Arwen. And then you're conjuring us out there. Maybe you need to repeat it once, twice. Don't do it more than three times. That's just bothersome. And sometimes it is okay to turn up empty. You're making a call here. Sometimes your recipient is just busy or doesn't want to talk to you. Again, we tried this on land spirits, on elementals, on, on the living dead, which means dead people who stayed behind to take care of a certain place. We tried with the spirits from the Ask Croatia. We, yeah, we tried it. We used it as an experiment, and this experiment apparently works, so make your own. In the end, give your spirits a polite license to depart, and just as polite as you conjure them. The license to depart is on the back. I'm a little bit pressed on time, so I'm not going deeply into it. It's quite self-explanatory, so. To conclude this whole thing, um, we looked a lot at the on, at the how. Let's have a cl quick look at the why. Why do we do this? Well, first and foremost, there's the technical answer. Conjurations provide a much deeper and clearer connection to a spirit than vision work or meditation. It also delocalizes the contact with localized entities. It means that you can talk to a spirit of a special place, as long as you have a link, without being at this special place. I mean, 
seriously, I might be an old dosy person. Every do it should be. But even I have problems focusing in pelting rain at minus seven degrees Celsius. So calling a spirit I need from the comforts of my library, well, appeals to me in the winter months. For the motivation, why? And, and oh, not to forget, a conjuration also draws the spirit nearer to our plane. It gives them a stronger hold in the material. So this is a main reason for it. And for the mot motivation, why? Well, most people usually turn to conjurations um, because they want something. They want a new house, they want a new lover, or they want the gruesome and painful death of their noisy neighbors. And yes, those motivations have been around since the very first grimoire. They're just not the smartest motivations to have. And then there's plain old curiosity. And that is fine regardless what other occultists might say. Granted, it might not be the safest field to fuck around and find out, but <laughs> yeah, you can find, you can just have the curiosity finding out does this really work? And if you do, please don't start off with the great underworld serpent of your local fault line, or with the great cosmic mover of gravity. <laughs> start small with a friendly local elemental. <laughs> and local is the key word here. The druidic reason to conjure is to be a good neighbor. Which, by the way, is interesting. Um, good neighbor is a euphemism in Celtic lands for, this, for the fairies. But you want to be a good neighbor to your good neighbors. You, want, you don't want them to boss them around. You want to work with them. You want to learn from them. And sometimes, well, have them teach you or you teach them. Because as much as we are looking for their influences in the world, they are looking at us and what we are doing. And there's a very, very interesting story um, here in this book, Clavis Goetia. It's about uh, a German goist from the 16th century. Um, he sought out spirits in a cave, but instead of asking them for treasure, as everybody did at that time, he actually refused them. No, no, I don't want the wisdom of the world. I don't want any treasure from you. I want to discuss with you moral philosophy. <laughs> and he did. And that is exactly what druids do. You, you go around and you have meaningful, educational and inspiring conversations with spirits. And you might learn a thing or two. And you can see how you can mutually benefit each other. So, in retrospect, the experiment in Manchester in the 90s that at first got the job done because the spirits did exactly what they were told to do. Yeah, that led to gentrification and ultimately another kind of misery there. It would have been wiser to maybe ask the local spirits, the genius loci. Well, let's hope that you and I keep on learning from our mistakes. Thank you very much. And we still have time for questions, if any. Yeah. Thank you so, thank you so much for inspiring um, hmm? talk. And I'm deeply moved. I can feel the spirit moving around and everything. Anyway, so deep bow to you. And my question is that techni um, te technicalities, yeah. Because hmm? in the grimoires, like um, the Megaton, hmm? you have you need to press so many tools to do the invocation work. So uh, in this way of druid, druidry, 
Yeah. I suppose that you don't need that much of tools. You don't need right? that much tools. That is right. I'm, I mean, <clears throat> so, uh, this is a walking stick. It also doubles as my personal branch of the world tree, and it is many, many things. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of the path of the empty or more or less empty hand. So if I go out and conjure spirit, I probably just go to the woods. I need the staff because that allows me to draw a circle. I have a flask of whiskey with me and maybe a meaningful sigil, like this stone I was given by a snake spirit, which actually has a snake in it. And, um, or nothing at all. You don't need many implements. You need the implements that are meaningful to you and meaningful to that particular work. But since you don't threaten any spirits, you don't need a sword. I can be very threatening with a sickle. This thing is sharp. But I don't want to. Any more Anyone questions? Else? Thank you. Uh, just out of curiosity, I saw that you, mm, you put in the second sentence of the invocation both your name mm -hmm. and your spiritual or magical name, yeah. like both of them. And I always saw that you need to have a magical name to protect your real name. No, you don't have to. It's a thing that depends on the tradition you're coming from. In some traditions, this is very, very important. And they give you, again, they give you a spiritual name. You don't choose it for yourself, you are given it. And this spiritual name is connected to your inner passport. You use it whenever you do any kind of inner and magical work, so it becomes your magical name. If you don't have one, don't use one. Use the name you're given, or use the name you're comfortable with. Use the name you are known at. So, and by the way, be open to um, any kind of nicknames. Yeah? I mean, I'm not a Denny. I, I <clears throat> hit anyone who calls me Denny. Uh, but um, if you are Louisa, and everyone calls you Lou. Well, you're Lou. Hmm? Thanks. How do I how do I know what the spirits like? You said like get educated about the spirits, but how do you find out? Is it in the books or do I ask them? Both. And that is actually the interesting part. If you take any spirit from any kind of grimoire, you get a hint on what they're probably good at and, and, and how they might react. But it also pays to ask them. As I said, Jake Stratton Kent wrote it actually in one of his books, and, and I found this very, very true. There is this effect of you have a sigil, you have a name, you call up the spirit, you ask the spirit um, who he or she or it is, and they answer, well, I just moved in here. I'm getting comfortable and I'm doing the same jobs, but actually I'm called something different. And they will, in most of the times, they will give you a special name or a special key to call them by. And they will give you a new symbol, if need be, and, and everything. And it's a engage with a spirit the same way and with the same politeness as you would with any other here in this room. How, I mean, I got an introduction here. You know what I'm probably good at, but um, I can do many other things. I'm a wicked cook, so ask me about my favorite recipe for stew, and I'll give it to you. Hi. 
I would like to ask you if it's possible and if you feel it, can you tell us um, an encounter that was very meaningful for you and how did you feel it in your body? How was the meeting with the spirit? If you can, thank you. That gets interesting because there are, there are a few which were very, very meaningful and um, Near the place where I live, there is an old quarry. And um, it's, it's beautiful now. It's completely overgrown. It's becoming uh, a nature reserve. And, um, but the earth was torn up there. It is, first and foremost, a place of destruction. And I went there, and I just sat there and became very, very quiet. And at one point, I found a presence in a ravine. And I went to the ravine and I sat there and all of a sudden, in meditation, I encountered an enormous golden serpent, or at least this is how it was presented to me. I thought, okay, this is interesting. This is the spirit of this place. And I just put out a little bit of feelers and said, right, I'm I see you, I'm interested in you, um, I would like to call you. And, yeah, because we had this, this experiment running, I started with, I drew a circle, I invited the spirit, and I found out that this particular spirit is a representation of life force, of regenerative life force. It was there to regenerate the land and do something new with the land. It was localized there, but willing to move if need be. So the first step I did was, okay, I now have a golden serpent I can call on. And I was given a name and I was given uh, a symbol and great. Now, I live in a place that Although I live in an old former abbey in a beautiful park, the rest of the town is quite ugly. So, yeah, they had too much money in the 60s. And uh, the thing is, I started to, um, to employ the spirit and, and sort of convince it, you're doing a great job at regenerating this place, this place here needs regeneration too. Would you mind moving in for a while or paying your attention there? And it does. And the interesting thing is that this spirit of life force is very powerful. It's, it's very moving within the body. Um, the thing is, I don't work too much with this spirit because the day after, I'm completely depleted. So it just takes a lot of out, of out of you because you're working with the spirit at that time. But it does work. We are slowly getting there to, well, developing the community again and making the place more beautiful. <sighs> that were very nice last words. Thank you Thank so you. much, Daniel. Thank you all. If you have any more questions, just find me and we have a drink or a fact.